you can give in the little wooden box um, out there. Uh, we do not pass an offering. It just takes time, those kinds of things. So we just move forward into the teaching time. But you can give that way. Uh, and if you're watching on Facebook Live, we want to welcome you here. We're glad you're a part of this as well. Some people will catch this on YouTube later today. So we're just glad you guys are all part of this as well. And if you want to give, you can as well. Uh, you can go to our website at amanacf.org, and there's a way to give there. And there's also a mailing address to the church. So wanted to say that. Let's go to John 15, verses 1 through 5. And get cranked up. Y'all ready to get cranked up? Yeah. All right, all right. Okay. Man, I'm ready. Uh, what's up, Mr. Charlie on the back? Right? That beard looks good, man. Everybody's going to look. Everybody's going to look, brother. Uh, it does look good. I'm going to tell you, that's a cool-looking beard right there. Okay, here we go. Just trying to get the tension off me for a minute, Charlie. That's all, brother. Thank you for helping me. Y'all ready for verse 1? Okay, this message is called In the Vine, In the Vine, okay? And um, let's see how this goes today. So it says, uh, Jesus is speaking. He just got through in chapter 14. He makes a very profound statement that just really changed my life tremendously. And we're not going there, but... This is all context related. In chapter 14, he says, Philip, he says, you know, he says, if you know me, you know the Father. And he says, listen very carefully how he says this. He says, the Father is living his life and doing his work through me. You, you see a lifestyle and you see spiritual advancement work. Okay? So when you think spiritually, you think uh, ridding yourself of sin. You think also kingdom productivity. Uh, you know, people call it witnessing to others or using your, your spiritual gifts for, for God. These things. Jesus put, Jesus, the Messiah, put the details of his life and the details of his ministry completely on someone else. We're talking about the Messiah now. He completely put that on the Father. And then he says things like, now you should live as I live. And we tend to look at that as, oh my God, i got to be perfect like he is. That's not what he's saying. He's not talking about the details of his life. He's talking about the approach of his life. You ought to adopt that approach. Well, you, as I did, I completely relied on the Father. Now I'm telling you, in the same way I did that, I want you to completely rely on me. To live my life and to do my work through you. This is why he said things like, take my yoke. For my, uh, my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. And he says, if you do this, you will find rest for your soul. You see? He's saying, I want the burden. I want that. I want you, if you labor in anything at all, to labor with all of your strength to trust me. To abide in me as I abided in the Father. This is the proper picture. And then... We get into John 15. Then he starts this thing off here, which is really not, he's not starting anything. He's right in the middle of a conversation when he says this. It's just we put chapter numbers on it. It was not there in the con. You know, as Jesus was not talking and then he paused and he said, chapter 15. <laughs> he kept going. This is, all, this is all in context. So he goes, he goes Jaden always laughs at my jokes. That's funny, man. So he says, uh, I appreciate that. He says, I am, by the way, there's an I am statement. There's an I am statement. You remember with the burning bush? I am that I am. Jesus is using an I am statement here. I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. See, he can do that. 
He can do that because Jesus makes a guarantee. In a moment, we're going to read a guarantee. He's saying, if you remain in me, you will bear fruit. See, the emphasis is not on the person. The emphasis is on him. He says, the emphasis on you is to remain in me. The, the burden on, on Christ is he will bear fruit through you if you do. So he's saying, if you're not bearing fruit, you, you're, you're, you're going to be cut off because you, you're, not, you're not remaining in me. It's not because you're not. Boy, I used to read this and think, man, I got to produce some fruit here. And that's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, 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 no. A branch, by the way, never produces fruit. It's the vine that it's connected to that is producing the nourishing sap that works through the, the branch. And that branch is 100% completely reliant on that. If the vine takes a day off, the branch doesn't get fed. And, and, and you know what? That branch, if, if it had a soul, it would completely rely and hope on that vine. And it would be patient and it would wait. Produce that sap when you think it's right, but you know best when it's right. You know what season to do it and when not to do it. And you know what, that's, that's what he's saying. He said, if you remain in me that way, you'll produce much fruit. Watch. And he says, but if you're not producing fruit, it's, it's only because you're not remaining that way. And this, this, is, the, this is what we're saying. We're going back to chapter 14 where he completely relied on the Father for all the details of his life and for the work of the ministry which covers actually both natural and spiritual. It gets really practical. Now, he says, verse 2, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, some versions say cleans, so that it will be even more fruitful. So you begin to remain in Christ, trust in Christ, depend on Christ, put your hope in Christ, and you're going to begin to see fruit. And you're going to begin to see your life being cleaned up in a way that it's now positioned in an even better way to bear more fruit. We call this sanctification. We call this growing in the things of God. And I think what happens is as we begin to see fruit, the understanding that we are to remain in Him becomes validated. And then we really begin to lean into Him. And then we begin to bear more fruit. That's what I think this is saying. Anyone who remains in him and bears fruit, the Father will clean and he will bear more fruit. Oh, that's only because you, that initial fruit has given us validation that, oh, this is the way. I am seeing many convincing proofs of this thing. And then, oh, I'm leaning in even heavier. And I'm bearing even more fruit. That's the picture. And that's what Christ wants us to see, I do believe. Verse 3. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. We've talked about that. It must remain in the vine. You know what he's saying? It must rely and depend on the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Notice when he says that. He says that coming off of this. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Then he says, you are the branches. Now listen to that. Two verses back to back. No branch can bear fruit by itself. You are a branch. What is this burden that we carry to become holy when we're told that we can't bear that kind of fruit because we're branches, why do we feel the burden to do it? Because we don't trust that he will do it. That trust is such a vulnerable place of humility that Christ, if you don't produce it, it's not going to happen. You get to the place where you're comfortable being uncomfortable, with that kind of vulnerability and trust, he says, oh, that's where, okay, now it's going to be real clear that it's me because you're totally out of the picture. You are completely convinced that you're just a branch. 
and that you cannot produce fruit, and now you're completely reliant on the vine. And watch him do his work. Watch him take care of even some earthly things. I mean it. It just, I believe sometimes he'll fix a broken refrigerator miraculously. Just to remind you. Just to remind you that, hey, I'm validating some things. Don't forget, there's a lot more things, way more important than that refrigerator I'm going to need you to trust me for. Way more important. Heather, cut, I mean, she, that knife, I'm telling you, she had her finger underneath an apple. And she cut, and I'm telling you, that knife, I mean, it cut her. And that thing, this is just yesterday, and that thing never bled. It's like it didn't happen. It was just like a little, she's like, I don't, she's like, there's no way. She said, that, that knife, I mean, it, it cut. She said, there's no way this thing is, I said, I'm telling you, boy, that was a miracle. <laughs> and it had not a whole lot of spiritual value. But you know what it reminds you? Boy, Christ, boy, you just never know with him. He can break out at any time. He can do anything he wants. I'm telling you what, we got to keep that vessel of flesh empty and ready and available for him to fill it. We just trust him. Uh, so, okay, with that, I want to say, remember, for terminology purposes, we went through some of this last week. For terminology purposes, remember, we've been trained our whole lives. We've been trained our whole lives to think, to feel emotionally, and to think thoughts based on the flesh. From the time you were born to the time you were born again, you learned to care for your life in accordance to the flesh. And even after you were born again, the, the, we, we, we've held on to a lot of that. And especially if you've not understood the abiding principle that we're talking about, completely relying on Christ, you've really hung on to that. Remember, you were born with a nature, and it is not the same nature God has. God does not have the flesh nature. When Jesus came in a body, that was a new thing for him. After all eternity of living in the Spirit, he takes on a flesh body. That was the exception to the rule for him. Thirty-something years later, he went back in the glory. He gave that back. That was just a little short time that he did that to identify with us and to show us how God wants to work through man. And, of course, to be our sacrifice. That was, that was an exception to the rule. God does not operate in flesh. It's not his way. He does not reason from the perspective of flesh. He reasons and he feels emotionally from the perspective of the Spirit, and he's saying, I want you, I want you to learn to live in accordance to the Spirit because that's my nature. He said, I've rebirthed you, a spiritual birth now, and I want you to come away from reasoning in the flesh and begin to reason in accordance to the way I live and the way I think. That changes things. So some terminology, you may hear me say earthly versus heavenly. You may hear me say, and, and, and not just me, but scripture. Scripture, when you see earth versus heaven, it's the same thing as man or God. It's the same thing. Sometimes you see it said this way. You see it said flesh or spirit. And by the way, it says they're in conflict with one another. Man's way is in conflict with God's way. The way of the flesh is in conflict with the way of the spirit. And the way of the earth is in conflict with the way of heaven. It's all the same thing, different terminology. And you see it. You see Paul talking a lot about the flesh versus the spirit. You see Jesus talking a lot about the thoughts of man versus the thoughts of God. You see Jesus even say to Peter, that thought, that, that statement that you made about me being Lord, that did not come from you from man, but that came from you from my Father who was in heaven. So you see, you see man in, in God. You see earth and heaven. You later, you see uh, Peter, he says, no, surely not. Christ, you will not go to the cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. 
And he says, for you have the thoughts of man and not the thoughts of God. This is just a different terminology for heaven and earth or man and God or flesh and spirit. They're just interchangeable word usages, and you'll, you'll see it throughout Scripture that way. Okay? So, but my, my, uh, my point is that we must learn, we must learn what it means to adjust and to adapt. Paul calls it being re renewed in, in, in your mind. He calls it renewing your mind with the washing of the word and these things. We are, our emotions and our thoughts are being transformed over to spiritual lens. We're putting on spiritual lens now. We're taking off the flesh lens. We're putting on spiritual lens and we're viewing every thought, every emotion, every situation through the lens or through the eyeballs of God and not the eyeballs of my first birth, flesh, but through the lens of my second birth, spirit, because that is the birth that is of God. That is the birth that is of his nature, I should say. Does this make sense? I feel like you're seeing it. Now, abiding. Jesus says, remain in me. Abide in me, sometimes it says. Live in me is another word. Live, to live, or to walk, or to abide, or to stay, or remain. This is all similar word usage throughout the New Testament. Old Testament uses the word dwelling place. It's all the same principle. It's all the same word usage. Abiding is not leaning. This is what abiding is not. It is not leaning on the kingdom of earth. What I mean by leaning is it's not that we don't operate here. It's not that we don't use the wisdom that we have. It's not that we don't use our past experiences. They're valuable. But what I mean by we don't lean on that is that that's not the end of our hope. In other words, when we reach the ends of our limitations, what do we do there? When we don't have the answer to the problem, when we don't have the finances for the bill, Emily, when we don't, when we have the situation that my wisdom and my efforts cannot solve, what is my mindset in that moment? Now that's going to identify if you were abiding in the flesh or abiding in the spirit. This is getting practical. That's, that's it right there. When you reach the limitations of your flesh, what's your emotional level like right there? It's going to tell you real quick what you're abiding in. The good news is it's, it's the direction to Christ is easy. It's, he's not hard to find. It's always the opposite direction of the flesh. You don't have to find Christ. You just have to leave the flesh. Because he says in Scripture, 1 John, he says, the Spirit abides in you. Now you remain in him. He doesn't leave us. We detach from him. Abiding is not leaning on the kingdom of earth or flesh or man. It is not allowing your limitations to be the ends of your hope. When, you, when, when the world says it's hopeless, if they were in your shoes, they would say it's hopeless. Those moments, you say, no, it is not hopeless because I'm abiding in Christ. And at any moment, the wisdom of Christ, which, that of which I would have never thought of, can come into my mind and I know the answer or the counsel or the understanding or the knowledge or the ability to do that of which I could not do. And had I abided in the flesh, that ability would have never came. Because God loves us too much to help us when we abide in the flesh. Because he doesn't want the rest of our lives to be handicapped by being a flesh pot, abiding in that mess. So he says, I'd rather you suffer today and not get what you need today than to give you what you want today. For today to be a better day for you, that the rest of your life you would have learned to abide in flesh and never experience the fullness of me. That's a really good father who does not get emotionally confused about that. 
Earthly fathers, you know it, I know it. We, we mess up in that area. Sometimes we give in. Because we want a better today. And we're handicapping tomorrow. Grandparents, you're good at this, right? Our Father doesn't do that. He's so loving. This is what abiding is. It's resting. Resting means I'm content to wait on the Lord, though I don't know the answer. I'm content. I don't have the finances, but he's either going to show me how to get them or he's going to be generous to me through somebody. He's going to make a way. And I know, I know he will. And, and I'm, I'm seeking that answer. And I'm waiting. And I'm content to wait. See, I'm not abiding in the emotions of the flesh. I'm not going to abide in fear. I'm not going to abide in freak out mode. I'm going to abide in contentment because I know Christ is in me. And because Christ is in me, I can hope for his glory in the form of provision in that case. Because Christ is in me, I can hope in his glory in the form of breaking addiction. Because Christ is in me, I can hope for his glory in the form of you fill in the blank. You know why you came to the altars. And that answer, just as a branch, would abide in the vine and be completely content to trust the vine for when the nourishing sap comes, we, like the branch, ought to exemplify the same contentment and patience in saying that answer will come as the vine Christ determines the time of that answer. It may not come today. But I trust his timing. Oh, that's abiding. That's abiding. It gets very real when we're talking about finances. It gets very real when we're talking about relationships. It gets very real when we're talking about sickness in the body. It gets very real when we talk about kids raising our children. It's very real when we talk about our jobs. All these areas. Christ is saying, abide in me. Because you know in every one of those areas I mentioned, they all get beyond your limitation at times, huh? He says, I loved you enough to give you those shortcomings. He tells Adam, I, 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 the King James Version says, I produce thorns and thistles for you. <laughs> the King James says, for you. So you can learn to make me your dwelling place. So you can really experience things that are way more fulfilling than you meeting your earthly needs. This just makes sense. I have some notes here. Let's see. Abiding allows, oh, this is cool here. I like this. Abiding allows heaven's ability to move through earthly vessels, you and me. It's the unlimited through the limited. So we have to deny the flesh. Y'all excited about that? I wrote in my notes here, we have to die to the flesh's desire to rule, to lord over us, to, to be the lord of your life. You know the flesh wants to be the lord of your life. Jesus, save me. Flesh, lord me. That's been the culture of the message throughout the land over a number of years. Christ, save me. Flesh, Lord, over me. And we have to die to the flesh's desire to lord us emotionally and to rule us mentally. Friends, that denial is a form of willful suffering. I always heard people say we don't suffer in America, and I always got upset because I thought, well, they're right. We don't suffer physically in America in the form of persecution. 
But as I began to think about it longer, I began to realize that as a culture of American Christianity, we don't suffer, but we don't suffer enough. Because our suffering should be first and foremost in the form of personally making an active decision to suffer in the flesh and to crucify the flesh. That ought to be a form of suffering that we delight in because we've learned. We've learned that the glory of Christ follows that every time. And if you're not convinced of that, it's because you've not experienced that. And if you've not experienced that, it's because you've not willfully suffered in the flesh. We're not only talking about the temptation of major things like adultery or hate or uh, pornography or lying and stealing and month of April taxes and stuff like that. I'm talking more along the lines of when you get, when you get beyond the limitations of your flesh to handle any given situation emotionally and mentally, where does your abiding take place at that point? Are you dwelling in the flesh or are you coming to a place of rest? Even though this thing is not met, I'm content because I know Christ is in me. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He did not say I could do all things because I'm very experienced and because I have provision and because I'm very smart and I have great ability. It's not what he said because he understood this thing better than anyone we've ever met. It's because Christ is in me. He said, I, I can go naked and, and, and hungry and, I, and I've learned that there's a secret in that state where I can be content and it's because my hope is in Christ in me. See, that's abiding in Christ. He's not freaking out. That's abiding Christ. That's worship. That's what the Bible's talking about. Every time, every time it's talking about picking up your cross and denying yourself and following him, look at the context of that. It's mental. It's soul realm. Ronnie, you like that term. We talk about that. It's soul realm. He says, you, Peter, you do not have the thoughts of God, but you have the thoughts of man. Now, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow after me. That's what he says. And right before that, he calls him Satan. He's saying anything else is the work of Satan. You say, well, does America worship false gods? And everybody talks about football and all that. No, that's a small God. The flesh is our God. And we have to deny him. We have to deny it. What I'm telling you is that we must deny the flesh and its desire to lord over us mentally and emotionally. That's soul realm. Your soul is where we fight this fight. I know you like that, brother, because you and I, we love this stuff. That soul is the battleground. We have to choose right there to worship flesh or to worship Christ. Abide in the flesh or abide in Christ. The spirit or the flesh. Um, Romans 6. Just a, just a couple verses on this here. Did I give you all that one? Yeah, I gave you all that one. Verse 3. Remember the word baptized means immersed. Uh, this is not, I don't see the word water on there anyway. This is not water baptism. He's not talking about water baptism here. He's talking about your born-again experience. You were baptized into Christ. You were immersed into Christ. Jesus, uh, uh, 1 John says that he abides in you. He's immersed in you. This is, a, this is the born-again experience. Now, we use this passage for water baptism because it shows what we're outwardly doing to express that of which has inwardly happened already in us. And this is, this is a great picture here, verse 3. He says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, that's a born-again experience. All of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. We need to fully immerse ourselves into the death of the flesh just as he fully immersed himself into the death of that cross. 
And then he transitioned that as a mental exercise, as a soul realm exercise by saying, you do not have the thoughts of God, but rather you have the thoughts of man. Now pick up your cross and deny yourself and follow me. See, this is an inward thing. But the outward picture is be crucified. Now watch, he says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It's not a one-time event. This is a daily event, a daily practice. He's saying, be crucified with Christ. Crucify your flesh and its desires to rule over you. And you will, you absolutely will. Remember, Jesus said, you abide in me. You will bear much fruit. You will. You die to the flesh and remain in me, you will bear fruit. What's with this saying? You die with him in the glory of the Father. Just as it res he resurrected Christ, he'll resurrect within you a new life. You, you can do this in one situation of your life and experience the life of Christ in that very situation and in another compartment of your life, not do it, and, 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 and you won't experience Christ there. It's crazy. It, 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 it's not even an all or none thing. I mean, it's like the areas of your life that you abide in the Spirit in, you're going to see Christ manifest there. And the areas you choose not to, you won't. Because He, He's gentle and meek and He don't take over anything. He says, you take my yoke. He doesn't say, I'm going to throw it on your neck. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. He doesn't say, I'm going to open your door and you better be ready when I do. No. He takes the low seat and wants you to say, oh, no, Lord. What are you doing sitting there? Come sit in the highest seat of honor in my home. Beautiful. He's not going to put himself in position for you to say, oh, no, Lord, what were you thinking sitting in my seat? Come, come and sit on this fold-out chair that I have for you. He's not going to allow a man to tell him that. Oh, no, no. He, he, he is Lord of glory, splendor, and majesty, and he will not put himself in position to be told that. So he does not assume the high position in your heart that you may be able to tell him that. Oh, no. That is not fitting. You wouldn't let your child talk to you that way, and he certainly will not. Rather, what he does in any given situation in our life, he takes the humble position of the low seat, and says, I would love it if my servant would offer me the high position in his heart, and I will take over that thing in your life. You will begin to receive the thoughts of Christ. You will begin to receive the words of Christ. You'll be in the position Jesus was in when he told Philip, the Father lives his life and, and, and does his work through me. Now, in any given situation of your life, you give it to Christ that way, and you will be able to say that for that situation. But you can turn around and hold all the cards in another situation, and it's going to be flesh. How many times have I, I'm talking about me, stood behind the pulpit and tried to do the work of the Spirit, change people inwardly without letting Christ do it? That's flesh trying to change something spiritual. It's not going to happen. can't happen. And it happens in a lot of churches every Sunday. They figure out what we're going to do for God and ask God to bless it. And God is not following the flesh. He has no relate. By the way, he has no relationship with your flesh. Remember, your flesh is cursed. It's going to die one day. He has no relationship with your flesh. He has relationship with your spirit. So therefore, we must crucify the flesh that he can have relationship with our spirit. But understand, in Romans 6... Verse 5, if, <clears throat> this is the if-then statement. Me and Jaden said if we cut out every if-then statement in the Bible, the Bible will look totally different. It'd have a lot of cuts in it. There's a lot of if-then statements, Chris. He says, if we've been united with him like this, 
in his death. Like this. What's he mean like this? Baptism. Immersed. Fully. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly, it's a guarantee, if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. I used to think resurrection is in the form of on the last day. And that is very true. But in addition to that, Christ who takes the low seat in the living room of your soul, he eagerly desires to resurrect and take over your life. He eagerly desires to resurrect. In fact, we begin to read scriptures that we only apply to the last day, but have much more meaning. For instance, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Yes, that is true on the last day. But what if he, in your heart, who abides in you right now, what if he says, oh, I'm coming right now, I have a work to do right now? Will he find faith in you, trust in him, abiding in the Spirit at that moment? If not, guess what? That work's not going to happen. Ask his hometown. He did a little bit in his hometown just because he loved them. And he might do a little bit in you because he loves you. But he's not going to do what he wants to do when the Son of Man comes. Will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man says, this is my time. I have, I, I, have, I have gone before. I have orchestrated the circumstances. This is the time. I'm going to do this. And will I find abiding in the flesh in that moment? Or will I find faith in the earth abiding in him in me? I, I, I think that's it. I really do. Let's look at, um, look at Romans 8. Just a page over maybe. Romans 8, 18, we, you can look at this as a last day scripture, and I believe the context is that. But the second glance, the spiritual glance, the context is daily as well. And he says this, I consider, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings, remember what we said about willful suffering in the flesh. He's not just talking about the police coming and confiscating your property. If that were the case, Americans have not been able to, to participate in Christianity yet. That's not the case. You can participate in the suffering, and Christ wants you to, because of what follows suffering. If abiding in him always follows fruit, and being baptized in his death always is, is always followed by resurrection power, then it is true that I consider that our present sufferings, I'm talking willful suffering in the flesh, denial of self, to flesh to rule over us mentally and emotional. We begin to die there. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth, they're not even worth comparing. Not even a comparison. Like peewee baseball, in, in the Olympic baseball, it's like, not, you wouldn't even compare those, those two. It's, this isn't even a comparison. That suffering you're going through that's making you cry and hurt, you're not even going to compare that with the glory that will be revealed in us. I'm telling you, you begin to die with Christ, and you, whatever area of that life is for you, you're going to see the glory of God. And what I mean by glory, you're going to see something develop from that that could have only come from heaven, that earth could not produce, that flesh could not produce, that man could not produce. That's what I mean when I say glory. You think manna from the sky. Moses said, and in the morning you will see the glory of God. Why? Because manna was glorious. Because the earth could not produce it. Flesh could not produce it. Man could not produce only God, heaven, or the Spirit could produce that. That's glory. Now, you begin to suffer for Christ by, den by willfully denying the flesh, and you will certainly see the glory that will be revealed in us and through us. And the Bible gives us the picture of before the eyes 
of man. So, I think that's the best I can explain that. I don't know how I can, I can't explain it anymore. I believe Christ gave me that. But the branch, the branch did not always come from the same tree. The engrafting message. The vine did not depend on the branch being right. The vine would receive a branch from any other tree. The gospel is going forth to all peoples everywhere. It was not dependent on the branch. The branch had one responsibility and it was to remain. And you know what happens? That branch had a different nature from another tree. But when it remained to the vine, it began to take on the nature. Now you got to get that. It begins to take on the nature of a different vine. And that of everything that was in that vine, the spiritual sap of that vine begins to flow through that branch no matter what that branch's background was. And that branch begins to change. That branch begins to look differently than it ever could before the abiding. Now you got to get that now. And Jesus, I believe he emphasized remain. This is not a detach, remain, detach, abide, detach, abide. This is remain. You can't get that connection if you keep starting it over. Remain. It's hard to remain. I'm sympathizing with us. It's hard to remain. I know. It's vulnerable. When you empty the flesh... When you empty the vessel of flesh, it is empty. That is a scary place to be. There is a matter of time. There's a time period that takes place between the emptiness of the flesh and the filling of the spirit. There's a time period. I don't know the time. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Other times it's Days, weeks, months, years. I don't know. I don't think years. I don't think months. But I don't know. If I knew, I wouldn't have to trust. If I really believe that God's ways are higher than my ways, and me being empty of flesh is better than me being filled with flesh, even if the Spirit has not yet filled me to His glories, I'll abide and I'll wait there. Because that is what the branch does. It abides and it waits for the nourishing sap. And it begins to produce the fruit that comes from the nature of the vine. And it loses all ability to produce its former nature. It really is. This Jesus really, with that picture of the vine, he really, he had intent with that. I really think so. So, um, we won't go there, but 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Yeah, let's go there. Just flash it real quick, please, Jen. I'm just going to... It says, we, we demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself, lords itself, lord, lord, rule, that sets itself up against the knowledge. That's a mental thing. This is soul realm. The knowledge of God. Watch. He says, we take captive. See, you make a choice to abide. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's abiding. You do that, you're going to bear fruit in that area. This is the scripture I want you to see. I told you about the waiting. Isaiah 40, verse 29. Very famous scripture. It's going to make more sense now when you think about the branch, abiding in the vine, waiting a time period to produce the fruit. Remember, you emptied the flesh 
And there's a waiting period before that living water fills you up and then you begin to see the glory of God. This is the filling of the Holy Spirit in any given situation. I'm not referring to an Acts 2 experience in the filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm not referring to uh, that type of moment. I'm referring to in any given situation having the filling of the baptism of the Holy Spirit take over that situation. It's only, I don't care if you had the Acts 2 experience already or not. We're not relying on something that happened a long time ago to take its effect on this situation in front of me now. It requires me now to let him do that by emptying this situation of the flesh. It doesn't matter if I had that experience. That experience itself will sit in the low seat of my heart until I welcome him to take the high seat. I think the charismatic church has seen that, has emphasized that a little bit incorrectly over the years. Well, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, so therefore he's going to do his... No, you have to still let him. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes, I love, I love the Acts 2 experience. I have experienced that. But I have the ability to not let that experience ever do its work by allowing my flesh to be the Lord. When the Bible very clearly says the Spirit is the Lord of the earth. Now I have to, I have to remove the flesh. And that is by the Spirit too. But then there's a waiting period for the baptism of the Spirit in that situation to begin to well up that living water, begin to fill that cup to where my cup runneth over. Speaking a little King James to y'all there. When that cup runs over, there's a waiting period. And I love the scripture. This scripture is talking about the abiding. I believe it's talking about the abiding, the, the point of abiding where you're clearly attached. I'm in, Lord. I'm there. But you're waiting. That, and he says, remain, 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 remain in me. Don't, don't detach. Just wait. Trust me. And he says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. You know what I read there? I, say, I, I, I feel like he's saying, he strengthens the empty man. Let's go to verse 30. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. 31. But those who hope, that word hope is kava in Hebrew. And that word means eagerly waits, comma, hopes. This is why the Bible says, he who hopes in the Lord will not be disappointed. Why? Because when he who abides in Christ will bear much fruit. You won't be disappointed. He who joins him in his death will join him in his resurrection. He who denies the flesh will experience the resurrection of the Spirit. This is all, I'm taking scriptures all day long on that. This, this actual translation is not the best. It says those who hope, it really says those who eagerly wait and hope. This is the Christ in me, whom I cannot see, hope of glory, which I fully believe will happen. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, that's the glory of Christ. And certain of what we cannot see, that's Christ in me. It's faith. Those who hope or eagerly wait in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll be like eagles, Joe. They'll soar. They'll lock in and never flap because the Spirit will take all the effort away. And he, they will soar not like a pigeon, not like a turkey. My flesh will soar like a turkey or a peacock. Peacock is perfect. Prideful, arrogant flesh. And no peacocks in heaven. You'll be like an eagle, man, soaring, locked in, and just... Joe taught me that. But I taught him that there's no peacocks in heaven. He didn't know that. 
Let me just end. Let me show you the effects of abiding. Psalm 40. Man, we are just we are just doing real good on time here. We're almost finished. Okay, Psalm Psalm 40. You have to remember there's a reason why God wants his glory. I showed you this, Chris, the other day, remember? That you have to remember there's a reason why God wants to uh, reveal his glory through you. It's because he loves the world. He wants the world to see Christ. You see, he came as a man in Christ Jesus because he wanted to identify with men and women. But he wanted to identify with humanity, so he came as a human. So he's still identifying Christ through humans to identify with other humans. So he wants to glorify himself through you. He wants to live through you. He wants us to be able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Because he lives his life and does his work through me. Now we have a... (laughs) Sounds arrogant if we say that because we don't bat a thousand at letting him do that. So everything you see in me is not Christ. But that is the goal. Anything spiritually productive you see in me is completely Christ. I'm convinced of that. Because I can do nothing apart from him. Look at Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. You see that? I waited patiently. I've denied flesh, and I'm abiding, and I'm waiting. Kava, eagerly waiting. I believe God's been waiting for us to wait. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Boy, he'll do that. You get in that abiding position, boy, you're going to have a little, you're going to have a connection, man. You're going to, you, 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 first of all, you, you're only going to pray for things that he would sign his name to. I think that's what he meant when he said, if you pray in my name. He's saying, he's saying, if you speak things that you know I support and, I, and I'm fully behind and I want, things that you would be confident that you could sign my name to, you pray that way, those prayers always get answered. They're not flesh prayers. They're just not. Okay, so anyway. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, out of the flesh. He took me out of the flesh, guys. And look where he put me. He set my feet on a rock and gave me. Notice who who did the lifting and who did the setting. You just abide. Remember Psalm 90 we read earlier? I make you my dwelling place. You establish the work of my hands. Yes, you establish the work of my hands. See, God set him, delivered him, and God set him on, on the rock. He's in an abiding position waiting, and God does the work. Now look at this. He put a new song in my mouth. You want to see what the results of that? When you're abiding, denying your flesh, and then he begins to fill you with his spirit in that given area. You want to see the results of that? He put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God. Oh, no longer do you feel like, oh, I need to go worship God. No, I I love God. You begin to, I just love God. I know him. He's amazing. I want to talk about him. I want to think about him. I want to be just like him. I want him to have his way in me. Boy, you begin to speak and sing praises unto him. Because you've tasted his glory. You, you, you tasted his glory. It's, it's not a chore for you to pursue God anymore. You're addicted to him. You want more, you've truly tasted and you've seen that he's good. That's, that's the result. The Bible says that in his presence is splendor and majesty. And it says that basically, in so many words, it says that, that the effects of being there is glory and honor and joy. Jesus said it this way, abundant life. You begin to enjoy this thing. And then look at the final result. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord because they're seeing Christ in you. You see that? Let's stand up and pray. I was going to go to Psalm 91. 
homework assignment. Read Psalm 91. I'm, see, I'm telling you, we're seeing this thing so clear. I believe the, boy, the Lord is just... He's breaking out in the hearts of man here. Let's kill the lights here and just pray together. God, we just love you. Just pray with me, church. Altars are open. You want to invite Jesus into your life initially? As in, be born again? Altars are open. You want to speak with somebody? Come speak with me or Pastor Terrell or whoever. Or you want to invite Jesus into a situation in your life. And I mean this way. God, my flesh is moving out. I want you to move in. I've been lean I didn't realize it, but I've been leaning on my flesh in a given area. I've thought of myself as the end of the line there. And I haven't really rested in contentment and full confidence that if I trust you, you will reveal the answer. You will reveal a way. That will, and, and when I receive that, it's going to make me sing. I'm just going to be re rejoiceful because I know you're going to come through. If that's you right there, you want to ask Christ to do that, you just come to the altar. Just begin to pray. Begin to ask Jesus. We're going to do a great, uh, the best we can to leave the altars as an environment of prayer. So when service dismisses, we're not going to do a lot of talking up here, so we're going to leave this open for prayer. But we, we, we can still fellowship in the foyer and even in the back here. So let's just be mindful of that. Let's pray together as we begin to dismiss. Lord, we thank you so much for revealing this treasure to us. That, Lord, we don't have to make ourselves holy so that we can have a relationship with you. But, Lord, that you're saying that if we abide in you and enjoy relationship with you, that you will actually produce holiness in us. You'll actually make us that of what we've been trying to do on our own. It's you. You carry the burden. Lord, we want to trust you for that. We love you, and I do. I just, I do, we just trust you for that right now. I thank you for revealing this truth to us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. You are dismissed.